and put it on our website, jonesco.com, and uh, it's usually there by tomorrow morning. Uh, I do want you to help keep our webmaster, uh, Dick Naylor, in your prayers. He's having a little medical issue and uh, going through some various tests and things, uh, but he's, uh, he's a great webmaster and very efficient, and just keep... Uh, Dick Naylor in your prayers, if you would, please, uh, that uh, the news that he's going to soon receive uh, is going to be all good stuff. So anyway, uh, anybody have anything else you want to bring up? Uh, I don't have anything at this point. Uh, so we're going to pass it on. I'm going to get, move on and uh, give a little introduction to... Uh, our speaker tonight, I believe, uh, I believe that he can share the screen when we when he's uh, ready to. And anyway, uh, most of us know Steve Lindbergh uh, been uh, part of our Zoom rock room for uh, a long time now, and uh, has been a great consultant when we needed some questions answered. And uh, we're really, really happy that he's part of our of our group. But uh, Steve is a, a professor at the University of Pittsburgh in Johnstown, part of the, part of the Division of Energy and Earth Resources. He got his uh, Bachelor's of Science at Waynesburg College in Pennsylvania and got his uh, Master's Degree at Sony of, uh, at uh, Stony Brook uh, in New York. He loves astronomy, meteorology, prehistoric life, earthquakes, and volcanoes. And I believe at, uh, at the college, he also enjoys teaching geologic field methods. And uh, I don't think anybody in the group tonight is going to be going on the, the Pennsylvania uh, Conference of, of uh, Pennsylvania Geologists in October. But I know Steve has a huge part of that uh, tour in the western Pennsylvania um this october um so uh anyway uh we're gonna welcome steve he's going to uh talk about abundant invertebrate fossils tonight so steve go ahead it's all yours boy thanks jerry uh that's, i appreciate that overwhelming uh um <laughs> let me see share screen um, you, do you don't have it let me see. Yep, you got it. Oh, I got it. Okay, you're seeing my screen, not the, there we go. Okay, is that, yeah, thank you for that nice introduction. It's nice to be with everyone again tonight. Um, I very much appreciate the um, uh, invite back. I'm gonna keep, um, is this visible to everyone? Can you see that? That's good for me. Okay, I'm rather than go full screen with the PowerPoint, I think I did this before. I'm going to keep it like this as long as everyone can see it. I, I had problems on uh, for, uh, last Friday morning when I taught my OLLI class. I went full screen with my PowerPoint and it kept locking up and freezing on me. So, and I had to restart and leave the class and come back in. So, I'll just leave it like this. But just as a brief introduction, um, I know Jerry should have emailed this out to everyone. Here, here are the details of uh, the upcoming October 24th uh, field trip to the New Paris Limestone Quarry in Bedford County. Uh, this is the same exact thing that I sent Jerry. Uh, this was an active um, quarry owned by New Enterprise Stone and Lime. They were mining the limestone out of here for aggregate and building stone. Uh, it was shut down, I'm going to say in the mid 80s, the late 80s, it was shut down. It sat for a long time being inactive. And I believe two years ago or two and a half years ago, uh, they decided to sell the property and the neighboring farmer, the neighbor, neighboring uh, property owner, Andy Lang, purchased it. And uh, we had a long history of bringing students there uh, from Pitt and on field trips and to do field work. So uh, he was more than thrilled to leave the quarry open. Uh, for us to visit any time. So there's there's no fee involved. Um, it's, uh, I have a couple of pictures here. Uh, there's no fee involved. There's ample parking. Um, 
We have lots of time yet to plan. I'll meet everyone at the at the Quarry Road entrance. It is a gated road, but once we drive in, it's a short drive in. There's ample flat parking. Um, the quarry's changed a little bit over the last five years from the picture I'm about to show you. Uh, we'll skip to we'll go to the map first real quick, but this is just um, just a quick review. This is off off Google Maps. Um, the uh, the town of New Paris is a small little hamlet on Route 96, which goes um, it runs south down to Shellsburg, which is on Route 30 and a couple of miles west of Bedford. If you're coming in on the turnpike from the east or the west, probably the quickest way to get here is to get off the Bedford exit on the turnpike, which is exit 11, uh, head west on Route 30, and it's probably not more than a 10 or 15 minute drive till you hit 96 north you'll come north on 96 till you get to new paris as you're leaving new paris you'll pass the uh, boyer orchards up on the hill if you're coming in from the south on the right and then there's a upmc new paris clinic i've had several people um ask me about an actual address that they could put into their um uh, gps to get them right there the quarry itself really has no road address, but there is a Cuppet, this is Cuppet Road, oh, the road coming in right here, this is Cuppet Road, and then you make a left on Quarry Road, unless you find a way to come in from the north, but you can, um, you can put in, uh, if you put in Quarry Road, New Paris, PA as a GPS site, it'll take you right to the Quarry Road, the Quarry entrance is, is well marked, and that's where I'll meet you, and here's, um, Here's just a view of the quarry from the entrance that I took a couple of years ago before new enterprise stone and lime closed it down. I decided to sell it privately. Uh, it's not an exceptionally large quarry, but it does expose uh, a wealth of fossiliferous limestones and calcareous shales. Um, what new enterprise stone and lime did before they closed the quarry was they blasted down most of this high wall right here. So this part of the quarry is pretty much filled in with some very large talus blocks, but in a way that was beneficial beneficial to collectors because we actually discovered um, some telsins, the tails of eurypterids in these large blocks that were blasted away. Uh, the floor of the quarry, and I'll have a geological guide for everyone that shows up, but the floor of the quarry is basically upper Silurian. Um, this is the Kaiser Formation limestone. So this is upper Silurian, uh, the Jersey Shore limestone. And then right here at this first bench, which is about 15 feet high, at the top of this first bench, you transition into the Laval uh, limestone, a calcareous limestone, calcareous shale. This is actually lower Devonian. So the neat thing about this quarry is that you, you can actually stand on the contact between the Devonian and the Silurian period, or if you're going from older to younger, the Silurian to the Devonian period. Uh, every one of the invertebrate fossils that we'll go over tonight, you can find here. Um, if you can't find them in their entirety, you can find fragments of them, uh, just about every one. And then we'll even go to the top bench of the quarry. The top bench of the quarry, we can walk around the edge of the quarry, Top bench of the quarry exposes the Corriganville and Mandata formations. And we actually call this little corner up here. We've kind of nicknamed this trilobite corner. So your best chance of finding a trilobite will be in the talus that's in this upper corner. The neat thing about the Corriganville up here on top is you can see this little recessed area right there. And that is a bentonite bed, which is an altered volcanic ash. So, um, Back in back during the Silurian end of the end of the Silurian into the Devonian, uh, the volcanic arc off the east coast of North America, these active volcanoes were depositing layers of volcanic ash on the on the shallow seafloor, and this volcanic ash can actually be radiometrically dated. So we actually have really really good age dates for um, for this uh, uh, unit here. So just a little bit of a preview, and and there are there are some pretty spectacular fossils and also other sedimentary. Uh, features exposed uh, in this quarry. So uh, with that said, let's go right into, um, and once again, I, I want to thank everyone for allowing me to speak again tonight. Um, I, I promise I'll try, I'll do everything I can to be done by eight o'clock because I know I can get long winded. So um, tonight's uh, presentation is a, is a guide to the, the most common um, invertebrate fossils. So those are um, 
real quick, a definition of invertebrate fossils, which happen to be fairly, fairly common uh, fossils. Invertebrate organisms lack uh, a hard bony or uh, cartilaginous skeleton. Uh, invertebrate fossils happen to be very common in the geological record, especially uh, the, the upper Precambrian, the Paleozoic era, when we get up into the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic, of course, we find more vertebrate um, fossils. But uh, for the most part, invertebrate fossils um, per, uh, had hard parts that consisted of an exoskeleton, a shell, armor, teeth. The hard parts of a lot of the invertebrate fossils that we're going to look at tonight were composed of chitin or keratin, a material similar to your fingernails, calcite, aragonite, or silica. Um, so what I've done is I've, I've divided the fossils into um, categories by phylum and class. And of course, this, this isn't 100% complete and not every class within every phylum is represented because that would kind of physically be impossible to do unless we spent an entire semester. So tonight we're just going to look at the fauna, uh, just the animals, no, no plants this time. So maybe in the, in the coming year, uh, at a future time, we can, we can look at fossil plants. So um, we're gonna skip the fossil plants. This happens to be a Pocopterus, a well-preserved Pocopterus frond uh, from right here, about a mile from where I live in Johnstown. This is from the uh, Allegheny Group Shales, uh, which dates to the Pennsylvania period. So a quick review, um, what exactly is a fossil? Uh, a fossil is basically the natural preserved remains or traces of any plants or animals that lived in the geologic past. Um, and when we look at fossils, we, we divide them into two major groups. There's two categories of fossils. The first type of fossil is what's known as a body fossil. A body fossil consists of the entire organism, uh, the entire plant, the entire animal, or part of the plant or the animal, a bone, a shell, a tooth. Uh, you have the actual preserved part of the animal's body. Uh, the second category of fossils, whether they're vertebrate or invertebrate, are trace fossils. Uh, trace fossils are the evidence that an organism was there, um, but we don't have the actual organism. We have the footprints, the tracks, the trails, the burrows, uh, a slide, something like that. Um, uh, the coprolite, I left coprolite out. So coprolite would be a, a trace fossil. So um, what exactly uh, the word fossil uh, comes from the Latin fossilis, which means to dig up. So basically, unless you're picking them right up off the ground, I guess technically you're still, you're still digging them up. So um, one, of the, um, one of the tenets of um, paleontology uh, that I stress with groups that I speak to and also the students in my class is I try to impress on them the, the length of time that living organisms have existed on the earth and the, the almost overwhelming number of uh, organisms, of species that have existed on the earth and some persist today, if not as a species, as a class or an order of family. But think about the last um, two or three billion years of earth history. Uh, and when we first find, we go back into the Precambrian and we first find um, evidence of fossilized organisms. Think about this enormous length of time and how many living organisms must have existed on the earth. And when we look at the assortment and number of different families and orders and species of fossils that we, that we find where we realize that we're looking through a, a glass very, very darkly um, as, a, as a biblical saying goes, um, we, we only have a glimpse, uh, of an estimate of what the total range of living organisms on the earth would have been like. Um, we, can, we can say with great certainty that the fossil record is very incomplete. We continue to find new fossils, new dinosaurs, new invertebrate fossils. We continue to make links and find transitional animals. But when we look at the length of time that individual species inhabit the earth and then possibly go extinct, uh, we know that we, we have a very incomplete picture of organisms that have uh, come and gone, evolved and disappeared on the earth. And we may never know. Um, paleontologists estimate, estimate, one of the statements I have here, paleontologists estimate 
uh, estimate that 99% of all living things to have ever inhabited the earth have gone extinct. And out of that 99% of organisms, we, we only find a small percentage of them. And I've, I've copied in another little um, highlight here, um, kind of the um, uh, abstract from a text. Uh, and this is from uh, David Nickel at the uh, Department of Geology, University of Florida in Gainesville. And one of the statements, well, he quotes from a previous paper is that the fossil record far from being complete represents only a small sample of past life. Um, furthermore, this is not a random sample, but is highly distorted and biased based on a variety of biologic and geological factors. So when we, when we look at fossils, we, we got to realize we're looking at a very skewed view of what ancient life on the earth would have looked like. Um, and I couldn't, I couldn't move on to invertebrate fossils without first mentioning this. Um, this had made the news last year. I made for some interesting reading, and this has continued to un undergoing a study, but uh, Tyrannosaurus rex, for example, not an invertebrate, but if you mention a dinosaur, most people know T-Rex. Uh, we're, we're, we're seeing a lot of new studies now where we're estimating the total number of individuals that may have inhabited the earth over the range of their existence. Um, Tyrannosaurus rex had a very brief period in which they roamed or inhabited the earth. We know that uh, T-Rex was only around for about 2.5 million years. So now out of the total uh, Mesozoic era, 2.5 million years, that's still a long time, but relatively short on the geological time scale. Well, over the 2.5 million years that T-Rex uh, inhabited the earth, the based on fossils that we find, they're estimating that at any given time, there would have been a standing population of 20,000 individuals. So what that means is if we could go back to the late Cretaceous period, uh, if we could go back 70 million years ago and uh, scout the North American continent, we would have seen a population of about 20,000 T-Rex at any given time. Uh, if we multiply that out over the length of time that um, uh, T-Rex existed, we get a number of about 2.5 billion I mean, imagine that, that's like staggering. So over a geological time period of uh, 2.5 million years, 2.5 billion T-Rexes inhabited the North American continent. So if there were 2.5 billion T-Rexes, how many well-preserved fossils do we have? Well, you look at the bottom of this little insert, there were only about 32 well-preserved um, post-juvenile T-Rexes in, in public museums today. That's about one out of 80 million. So even though T-Rex is a very um, popular fossil, we only have a, a, a brief glimpse of what it was really like. Most of the T-Rexes that inhabited the North American continent uh, died and uh, disappeared without leaving any fossil trace. And I, I wanted to mention this too before going on to the invertebrate fossils, uh, the recently discovered uh, notosaur uh, the Boreala pelta that was found um, at the Suncor uh, tar sands mine in Alberta, that incredibly preserved uh, notosaur, the armored dinosaur. Um, think of the odds of something like this dying and being preserved, and, and especially being preserved in this fantastic state of preservation where we've even been able to detect color um, in the plates on the back of the dinosaur. Um, th this, this probably ranks as one of the most outstanding dinosaur fossils ever discovered. Um, but let's move on to uh, the invertebrate fossils. So something else uh, just to go over very quickly is, um, you know, the, the conditions for something to form a fossil uh, in most cases uh, are pretty unique. Um, what makes the best fossil? Well, hard parts. If you have hard parts, uh, bones, teeth, shell, uh, wood, um, calcite, silica parts, uh, they, they will preserve, be preserved the easiest. Uh, typically, after an organism dies, 
we look for it to be buried very rapidly by sediment. We want the organism to uh, sink into mud. We want it to be covered by um, uh, a landslide or, or some type of rock fall. Uh, we want it to be buried in, in silt or in tar. Um, for the organism to be fossilized completely, it must escape the normal decay process. Most of the time, uh, we want to avoid predators and scavengers that, that rip the organism apart and scatter the parts. Uh, we want an environment that tends to be quiet, where the entire organism will settle to the bottom and be preserved. And then probably most importantly, um, there's lots of different methods of fossilization. Um, but normally animals, invertebrates, invertebrates are fossilized by the, the, the process known as replacement, where the original material dissolves away and it's replaced molecule by molecule with minerals that are in mineral rich waters. Um, so, you know, poor Mr. Uh, Triceratops here, or for us, not so poor, because that's why we have the spectacular fossils of Triceratops. Triceratops or another organism slips into a body of water and he drowns. He sinks to the bottom. Uh, predators and scavengers can't get to him. He's rapidly covered by sediment and the magic of fossilization takes place. Um, the, the science of studying what happens to an organism after it dies and goes through the process of fossilization is called taphonomy. So uh, a taphonomist studies the process of fossilization and what happens uh, during burial decay and preservation. So um, the invertebrate fossils I'm gonna show you will be keyed out. I'll, I'll explain to you when they existed, what their geologic range was. Uh, from like Precambrian to Permian or Permian to Paleocene. Um, so we're all familiar with the geologic time scale. I'm not going to take a great deal of time to go over this. But one of the things I noticed when I when I put this time scale um, up, uh, obviously this is from a European country because right here it mentions the great coal forests of Britain and they have the Carboniferous and it's not subdivided into the Mississippi and Pennsylvania. So um, European geologists like to just call it the Carboniferous here in North America. We like to swing out the Mississippi and Pennsylvania. So let's look at um, let's look at the invertebrate fossils. So we'll start with uh, what has to be pretty much everyone's. Trilobites aren't your favorite invertebrate fossil. Maybe after we go to the New Paris limestone quarry and you find a couple of really neat trilobite uh, pygidiums or uh, cephalons or possibly a whole trilobite, maybe there will be. So um, trilobites, uh, an, an exceptional invertebrate fossil. They're an important invertebrate fossil for a lot of uh, different reasons. Uh, they're fairly common. We know of thousands uh, of different species. Uh, trilobites belong to the phylum uh, Arthropoda, uh, which is from the Latin means jointed foot or hinged foot. Um, trilobites are in their own class, their class trilobita. Uh, the geologic range is, um, we begin to see trilobites from the early Cambrian period to the end of the Permian period. They were uh, victims of the great dying at the end of the Permian. But during the Permian period, they were already on great decline. Uh, trilobites today are extinct. Um, the typical trilobite was covered with the hard exoskeleton uh, it had, these were marine, exclusively marine saltwater animals. They had segmented bodies, very evolved complex eyes, legs, and gills. Uh, like other arthropods, uh, trilobites would molt their shell. The shell does not grow. The animal grows and then the shell gets too small and they split out of the shell. Uh, the shell will sink to the bottom or be munched on by predators for the little bit of tissue that might be left in it. Um, and then the animal over a period of several days or weeks hardens a new shell, similar to crabs, lobsters, and other arthropods today. Uh, trilobite shells were composed of calcite, calcium phosphate with in a lattice of chitin. Um, and not to get into a lot of uh, chemistry here, but the basic formula for chitin, um, chitin is actually a type of a polysaccharide. So, uh, Trilobites are found as both complete and partial shells. They're very common in Paleozoic rock layers. Uh, here's a, um, I included a lot of photographs of the fossils from my collection. Here's a, a large trilobite, partially restored. This is from Morocco. 
Uh, and here is uh, from down by um, Ocean City. Here's uh, part of the uh, shell of a horseshoe crab, which is often called a living fossil, not really related to a trilobite, but we can imagine if you've ever seen a horseshoe crab shell uh, down on the beach, the same type of material uh, probably made up the shell of a trilobite. Um, trilobites uh, make excellent index fossils. Uh, an index fossil is a fossil that tells you pretty much what geologic period uh, or epoch or stage uh, you're working in. Uh, trilobites evolved very, very rapidly. Um, at the beginning of the Cambrian period, they had a very, very rapid evolution um, and they diversified into different families very quickly. So we can, um, we, depending on the type of trilobite that we find, uh, we know uh, what the age of the rock layers are that we're working in. Uh, so the definition of an index fossil is an index fossil is a, a fossil that should have a wide distribution. You find it across a large geographic area, but it only existed for a short period of time. Uh, T-Rex would be a good example of that. When you find a T-Rex uh, fossil uh, in place in situ in the rock, uh, you, know, you know that you're looking at that 2.5 million year time period. Um, Here's a, I've got to get a copy of this poster. Unfortunately, I don't have one, but these are index trilobites of North America. Um, these are all of the important trilobites that we find here in North America. I think these are subdivided by, it might be by family, um, beginning with the uh, Cambrian period. So these are all of the uh, Cambrian trilobites, Cambrian, uh, Ordovician, Silurian, uh, Devonian, Mississippian, and you can see that by the end of the Paleozoic era, trilobites are going undergoing a huge decline. Uh, Mississippian, Pennsylvanian, and then finally Permian. So by the time you get to the Permian period, um, you only have one or two species of trilobites uh, remaining. Um, many of the trilobite fossils that we find are actually molted shells that were left behind. Uh, I'm going to say the majority of trilobite shells that we find. Uh, if you think about it, when you find a when you find a fossil trilobite, there's really only two possibilities. You you have the actual animal that was died quickly, maybe in a underwater uh, landslide or a mudslide or a poison, uh, a small little area like at high tide that dried up. So you either have the entire animal um, or you have a molted shell. Um, so usually most of the shells that we find of trilobites are molted. And, and a lot of times there's a way that you can tell uh, when trilobites molted, uh, the cephalon uh, had weak points in it called the free cheeks. And what would happen is that's where the shell would split. And the uh, cephalon, the good glabella, would usually tip to the side and the trilobite would wiggle out of that shell and leave the shell behind. So a lot of times we find trilobite fossils that look like this. This is a molted shell. So you're seeing the um, cephalon has separated from the rest of the thorax and the trilobite has crawled out and gone his way and that shell sank to the bottom and, and became fossilized. So uh, here are a couple of trilobites uh, from my own collection. I believe this is a drotops from uh, the Devonian of Morocco. Um, here's what I just call it a flexi. This is from the Ordovician of Ohio. Uh, these are Cambrian king eye trilobites. Um, here's a phacopsid family trilobite from here in Pennsylvania, another one from Morocco. Uh, here's a large coiled Moroccan trilobite. You're kind of looking down at uh, his glabella, the beak of his nose, and here's his left eye. Um, so uh, here's another view of that, that previous trilobite. So this one is mounted on a, a wooden platform. Uh, trilobites would occasionally burrow into the mud. Um, they would burrow down into the mud looking for food. And we occasionally find, at least this is what we think they are, here's a trilobite trace fossil. This is from down, uh, it was from, I believe it's from down in West Virginia. Uh, so this is a burrow that was recovered um, from a trilobite that had burrowed down into the mud. Um, trilobites had incredibly evolved eyes. Um, as a matter of fact, the eyes of trilobites uh, are used to classify them. Um, 
there were different uh, different groups of trilobites based on whether uh, they had a single cornea or separate corneas. But the, the trilobite eyes were made of crystalline lenses, usually calcite lenses, and they were faceted like the eyes of insects. Uh, and occasionally, if you have a well-preserved trilobite, uh, this one from my collection, you can see those beautifully faceted individual eye cells. Um, I didn't, uh, I didn't want to spend a lot of time on this one, but an, another arthropod that makes spectacular fossils are the Eurypterids uh, or sea scorpions, another jointed uh, arthropod with a hard chitinous shell. Uh, Eurypterids are, are, are typically Silurian period. Uh, this happens to be one of my better, better finds that I've had in my collection for uh, many years. This is a Eurypterid. Uh, Remipides, this is from the Silurian period up in Fort Erie, Ontario, Canada. Uh, we were splitting apart the limestone and I broke the piece apart and wow, there he was. Um, unfortunately, the other pieces, this was on the edge of a little outcrop, the other pieces, the telson and the tail was missing, but I was, I was more than pleased just to find that much, the positive and negative of the uh, Eurypterid. So those are the trilobites. All right, now we have the... Um, we have the crinoids, uh, spectacular uh, echinoderms, uh, trilobites, uh, I'm sorry, crinoids are in the phylum echinodermata, uh, which means hedgehog skin or spiny skin. Uh, they're in their own class, class crinoidea. Uh, they thrived beginning in the Ordovician period and many species still survive today. Uh, they are um, echinoderms. They're related to starfish, sea urchins, brittle stars, uh, sea cucumbers. Uh, the majority of crinoids resembled uh, plants, kind of like a flower, but this is actually a, a living echinoderm. Uh, some of them grew up to four, five, six feet in height or larger. Typically, they were uh, a typical crinoid is within maybe five to six inches. Uh, the body or calyx, the, the stem, and then the hold fast, the roots. Uh, there, were, there are layers of limestone where you can find nothing but thousands of crinoids all laid out. And it's kind of like a death plate where they must have been covered by some underwater turbidity current. Uh, they make spectacular fossils since they consisted of uh, calcium carbonate uh, plates. They are usually extremely well preserved. Uh, these are pieces from the Ordovician period in Kentucky, uh, a piece of limestone with uh, disarticulated columns and plates from crinoids that have been beautifully preserved. Uh, some much, much larger crinoid column sections that resemble like stacks of little Cheerios. There are also some brachiopods in here. Um, two of the better crinoids that I have in my collection. Um, this is from the Edwardsville Formation, which is Mississippian period from a very, very famous location, Crawfordsville, uh, Indiana. We have the stem and the calyx of the crinoid, along with all the beautifully preserved arms and these little pinules. Uh, and then this, um, if anyone's taking part in the field conference of Pennsylvania geologists, uh, the weekend of October 7th, 8th, and 9th, uh, the quarry that I found, this one, and we will be going to, this is from the J.V. Thompson Quarry in Fayette County, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, this is from the Mississippian period, Wimps Gap limestone. Uh, a tiny little, about an inch, inch and a half crinoid. I did a little bit of prep work on this to remove some of the matrix around it, but a beautifully preserved um, calyx and arms and these little tiny pinules. So uh, here's the hold fast. Uh, the majority of crinoids stayed anchored to the sea floor by what looked like roots, but were actually a part of the living stem. So these roots would have had a soft fleshy interior. So we're actually looking down the length of the column. So this would have been, you're looking down at the sea floor and the uh, column, the stem of the crinoid being snapped off here. Uh, that's how I found that sample. So I never found the rest of the crinoid that was attached to it. Um, in the same, um, Phylum as crinoids are blastoids and cystoids. Uh, a cystoid name because it kind of looks like a, like a biological cyst and a blastoid because it resembles, um, uh, some blastoids resemble uh, like the blastoid stage of a fertilized egg. Uh, blastoids are also uh, present in a lot of um, 
Mississippi and Pennsylvania period rocks, uh, uh, Ordovician to Permian period, uh, same thing, calcareous plates. Uh, these are echinoderms. They were basically filter feeders uh, in the ocean uh, with the little openings and, and resembling a, um, uh, a sand dollar or a sea urchin, but picture it attached to the ocean floor with a stem. Um, here is a, uh, here's a blastoid uh, that I found from the same Wimpscap limestone quarry in Fayette County, Pennsylvania, a relatively small one. Uh, it's been cleaned a little bit. Did a little bit of prep work on that. The stem would have been attached to the bottom here. This is the calyx and these little grooves would have been open. And this is where the seawater would have filtered through. And we call these the ambulacral grooves. Uh, cystoid, a little different morph morphology uh, than a um, crinoid. Uh, then we have the echinoids, uh, still uh, same phylum, but the class echinoida. Uh, echinoids are the sea urchins, the sand dollars, uh, very, very common fossils, especially in Cenozoic sediments. If you get down to the Gulf Coast, uh, you can also typically find these along the Georgia um, and North and South Carolina coast living ones, but also fossilized ones that are that come out of the sediment. Um, here are a few echinoids. Uh, these are from the Eocene, relatively recent Cenozoic era, uh, Eupatagus. Very, very common fossils. Uh, these can be collected in many, many places uh, down in Florida and the southern states, and they're often um, very, very beautifully preserved. Uh, cephalopods. Uh, I think um, after trilobites, or I'm, I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of torn between uh, what are my favorites, trilobites or uh, the cephalopods, the ammonites. It, it might be a tie, but uh, cephalopods make absolutely uh, spectacular fossils, um, and the, the phylum uh, or the, the group of cephalopods, the phylum mollusca, encompasses uh, hundreds and hundreds of different animals. Um, mollusca meaning soft. I believe that comes from the French meaning soft. So the uh, mollusca, the cephalopods are uh, soft-bodied animals. So the geologic range is Lake Cambrian uh, to modern day. The uh, Modern chambered nautilus of the Pacific Ocean is a living example, almost a, a living fossil of what nautiloids look like 200, uh, 300 million years ago. Uh, the cephalopods, the nautiloids, and ammonites were uh, soft bodied marine animals that may or may not have a, a hard external chambered shell. Uh, modern examples of the cephalopods are uh, the squid, the cuttlefish, the nautilus and the octopus, uh, extinct classes, extinct groups of the cephalopods include the ammonites and uh, the orthoceros, the straight-shelled orthocones. Um, oftentimes these fossils grew to in enormous sizes. I mean, I've seen fossils of ammonites and cephalopods from the Mesozoic era that are three, four, five feet in diameter. Um, they evolve very rapidly during the late Paleozoic and into the Mesozoic era. Um, one of the main differences between a nautiloid, uh, if you have a nautiloid shell and an ammonite, is um, the internal anatomy. A nautiloid has a tube that connects the different growing chambers uh, called a siphuncle. And in a nautiloid, the siphuncle runs through the center of the shell and follows the spiral of the shell. This is basically a gas regulating tube, and that's how the animal would regulate his buoyancy. So in a nautiloid, the siphuncle, which is sometimes preserved in a fossil, siphuncle runs through the um, middle of the shell, but in a ammonite, the siphuncle runs along the outer edge of the shell. So if you can't tell from the outside, you can always uh, slice the shell in half and look and see where the siphuncle is. Uh, ammonites and nautiloids have what's known as a suture pattern. Uh, inside the shell, the animal lives within the uh, opening, the front chamber, but the siphuncal runs through all the previous growing chambers. And as the animal grows, he seals off the chamber behind him. And over geologic time, um, we call this the septa, the septa or the septum, the, um, uh, the plate, the plate that seals off the growing chamber becomes more and more complex over time. Um, so 
uh, in a nautiloid, the uh, septa, or on the outside of the shell, we refer to this as the suture line. The suture pattern is very simple. Uh, and there's actually a technical term for this that I didn't um, include, but the suture line that shows the internal sealing of each chamber is very, very simple with just some basic waves. And then as we go through geologic time, uh, especially, well, the ammonites, ammonites started out with a, a, what we call a, a goniotite suture pattern, and then a serotite suture pattern, and then finally the classic ammonite suture pattern. So we get this very, very involved suture pattern that when you polish the shell can be absolutely beautiful. So here's just a couple of examples. Um, these are, uh, this is an ammonite from uh, Madagascar. Uh, these are straight shelled orthoceras from uh, Morocco. Um, this one is from uh, Russia. This is a Russian ammonite for the Mesozoic. Um, I believe this one is also Moroccan. And these are iridescent ammonites. Uh, the aragonite that was preserved on the outside of the shell um, will diffract and refract the light that's being reflected off the internal layers. And this happens within the first few thousandths of an inch of the outside of the shell. So we often find these beautiful iridescent ammonites uh, where that part of the um, aragonite on the shell has been preserved. Uh, here are some other ammonites. Uh, this is, uh, these are from uh, Madagascar. These are Madagascar ammonites. And the reason I showed these is you can see the outside of these shells have been polished and you can see this beautiful uh, wavy intricate suture line that zigzags across the outside of the shell. Um, and that's how you can tell that these are ammonites and not uh, a nautiloid. Here's um, a classic. These uh, are being exported from Madagascar uh, at a, a very high rate. I'm not quite sure how much longer the supply will last, but they make beautiful display pieces. This is Cleanoceras, uh, a Cretaceous period ammonite from Madagascar. And the outside of the shell has been polished and you can see that beautiful, intricate, involved uh, suture pattern. And that represents this right here that septa, it represents that point right there where the internal septa touches the outside of the shell, the zigzags back and forth, very involved. Um, and that, and we're, we're able to trace that across the evolutionary period of ammonites. So uh, corals, um, we'll move on to corals. Uh, very, very common fossils because they have a hard calcium carbonate shell. Uh, corals belong to the phylum Cnidaria. Uh, that's a relatively new change. Uh, it's a new phylum name. Cnidaria uh, means nettle or, or stingers because most corals have little tentacles on them and stinging cells. Uh, corals are present from the late Precambrian to modern day. Uh, the animal, it's a soft bodied animal that lives in a shell uh, called a corellum. Uh, the body of the animal is called a polyp. Uh, I don't show really any examples of living corals here. Um, there are hundreds and hundreds of different species of modern living corals. Uh, the two most common fossilized ones that are now extinct are the tabulate corals that we call halocytes and favocytes, uh, and also um, the rugos, the horn corals of the Paleozoic era. If you go to the New Paris Quarry uh, on October 24th, you'll be able to find some, uh, there are some pretty neat uh, halocytes and favocytes corals there. And you might even have a chance of finding some horn corals. Uh, the popular Petoskey stone from uh, Michigan, uh, I believe there's even a town called Petoskey, is a, a fossilized uh, Ragusa hexacoral um, that's, that's now extinct. Uh, fossil corals, or, or at least corals from the Paleozoic and Mesozoic and Cenozoic era, make um, really, really well-preserved fossils because they had a hard uh, calcium carbonate shell. Uh, these are horn corals. This is Heliophyllum uh, from the Devonian period of New York. Uh, there are places I've been to in, in upstate New York where you can literally pick these up off the ground. They weather out of the surrounding shales and limestones by the thousands. Uh, and here you're kind of looking down into the shell. That's where the soft-bodied animal would have been um, uh, living in that shell and anchored in by all these little septa that radiate out from the center of the shell. 
this is from the new Paris quarry uh, that we'll be going to. Um, this is a uh, this is a Halicides chain coral uh, that was uh, broken out of a large block of limestone. This is actually a fairly large piece. I didn't put a I didn't put a reference in here for scale, but this piece right here is about the size of um oh uh, it's about the size of my my hand, and uh, you can see the intricate. These are the chain corals. Uh, there was a little animal, a little polyp that lived in each one of those chambers, and these are now uh, extinct today. Here's a tabulate coral, close up. Um, you're, you're looking kind of like at a cross section. The, the living surface of the coral would have been up here. And these are previous polyp chambers. So as the corals uh, die, a new one uh, grows on top, they seal the chamber off below them. And you can see this is why we call these the tabulate corals. This scale is in inches. So we're probably looking at, um, we're looking at little chambers here that are about a millimeter uh, in width. And this is from the Ordovician period of Kentucky. Um, gastropods, we're still in, um, uh, oh, nope, now we're in the phylum mollusca, all right? Well, back in mollusca, the same thing as the cephalopods, but the gastropods are what we typically think of as snail shells. Uh, very common fossils, the Lake Cambrian uh, to modern day. Uh, the gastropods are an incredibly large and diverse group of animals. It includes whelks, conches, snails, abalone. Um, there are some modern species like the uh, slug, that's a, a gastropod that has no shell. Um, very, very common uh, invertebrate fossils. The main reason is because they have a, um, a hard shell. Um, the Turritella agate of common name that's found out in the Green River Formation, uh, the Eocene of Wyoming. Here's a, a slab that I have in my collection, a, a rough piece and then cut and polished and then some tumble pieces of Teratella. Uh, these, are, these are preserved gastropod shells, um, but the interesting thing about Teratella agate is these are not Teratella and this is not agate. Um, so the, the tag here describes that it's actually um, it's actually a gastropod known as Alemia tenera. Um, and the rock, uh, the rock is out, actually a dense uh, chalcedony. Um, in order to be an agate, it would have to be banded, and it's not. So it's misnamed, but it's an excellent example of a recent um, gastropod. Okay, then under phylum mollusca, we have the bivalves. Bivalves are the clams, uh, the oysters, uh, clams, oysters, mussels, um, cockles, scallops. Um, if you've ever been down to Calvert Cliffs, uh, Maryland uh, State Park, that's the, that's the bivalve, um, uh, bivalvia mollusca collecting haven. Um, here's a large, uh, it's been in my collection for a while, I can't even remember where I acquired it, but this is, um, this is an internal cast. Uh, this is where the mussels would have been attached to the shells. These are sometimes called the heart, heart fossils or uh, heart clams, they kind of resemble the size of a large mammal heart. Uh, but this is the internal cast of a large bivalve, and this is from the Cretaceous period in Texas. Uh, you can see some of the original calcium carbonate shell material is still on there. And the scars where the internal muscles that held the shell together can still be seen. Here's Calvert Cliffs. Um, this was a couple of years ago. Uh, I was kind of thrilled to be able to collect that large piece. This is, um, these are large bivalve scallops from Calvert Cliffs, Maryland. This is Miocene, these are from the Chop Tank. I know Jerry has talked about uh, Calvert Cliffs in the past, this is from the Chop Tank in St. Mary's Formation. Uh, Chesapectins, nephrins, uh, and there are places down here, they, all of these loose blocks were packed with absolute tens of thousands of these. Uh, I had to go away with the large scallops. I wasn't successful in finding any shark teeth that day. Um, okay, the brachiopods. I'm gonna try to speed up here a little bit. Uh, don't wanna go on too long, but um, the brachiopods mistaken for clams and bivalves, but they're not. So they look very much like bivalves and clamshells, but brachiopods, the word brachiopod or brachiopoda means arm foot. Uh, in reference to the pedicle, this tough little muscular stalk that would anchor the shell to the bottom. So he could mainly, a lot of brachiopods would 
float back and forth in the current because they were filter feeders. But um, brachiopods are in their own phylum. They are not mollusks. They are in their own phylum, brachiopoda. Uh, they're from Cambrian to modern day. Um, they are uh, what makes them different than bivalves, clams, and mussels is brachiopods are, uh, they have a lophophore. A lophophore is a horseshoe shaped feeding organism that's lined with cilia. And the organism will open and the cilia will, will make the water flow into the organism to filter feed. Uh, they're more closely related um, to bryozoans uh, than they are uh, clams. But brachiopods make spectacular fossils. Some of them are quite large. They're extremely ornate. Um, especially the spirifers and the atropas. Um, they have these ornate shells. They were bivalves, but one valve was always larger than the other. So they have unequal, they're, they're asymmetrical in their valves. Um, in some places, uh, brachiopods can be picked up by the thousands. These are from, uh, these are from Trimble County, uh, Kentucky. They're platystrophia. Uh, Ordovician brachiopods. These are some of the largest brachiopods I've ever seen. Um, I was absolutely amazed when I saw the size of these brachiopods. You can see the scale of inches up here. Some of them are two inches across and they're perfectly preserved. I haven't, I haven't cleaned them completely. The neat thing about these, uh, a lot of these brachiopods from uh, this location is they're hollow and they're filled with calcite crystals. They're like little geodes. Uh, here's a spire for brachiopod that's on that same piece that I showed you earlier with the crinoids on it. Um, so uh, bryozoans, uh, depending on the units that you're looking in, well, bryozoans can be extremely difficult to find, but in some places they're really common. There are lots of bryozoans at the New Paris Limestone Quarry. Uh, during the Paleozoic era, Bryozoans were major reef builders, along with corals. Um, they, they were the builders of reefs. Uh, the word bryozoa, uh, they are in their own phylum, an important enough organism to be in their own phylum, so it's phylum bryozoa. Uh, bryozoa means moss animal because they look like little sticks of green moss. Uh, they're easily mistaken sometimes for corals, especially the stick bryozoans with the little openings on them. Uh, and that is, those are the zooids where the, uh, where the little individual animals live. So bryozoans are colonial animals. Uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of different species. They, they occasionally make spectacular fossils of different types on the rock. Uh, they're lower Ordovician to modern day. Bryozoans still inhabit both fresh and salt water today. Uh, and they have a loaf of fork. Uh, the microscopic animals have a little horseshoe shaped organism with cilia that bring the seawater into the filter feeding mechanism. Uh, and they may resemble, um, they may resemble corals. So here's a, uh, here's a fossil, I like to call it a fossil hash plate, uh, brachiopods, broken brachiopods. And here are some, although they're really not well preserved and I haven't really etched these out yet with vinegar or acid, but here's, here are some large stick bryozoans. Uh, and these are fairly numerous at the, um, at the uh, New Paris Quarry. Here's a really, this is not mine, this is uh, snatched off Google, but this is a really, really well-preserved, uh, and I included it here because it's just a spectacular example of when you find really, really nicely preserved bryozoans. Now this is a, one centimeter is the length of that, um, box right there. So we're looking at bryozoans that, oh, you know, maybe about an inch in length or less than an inch. So we have brachiopods and we have bryozoans. Um, I usually tell people the easiest way to identify a bryozoan, if you can't see it with the naked eye, look at it under hand lens and you'll see all the little openings on the uh, preserved skeletons on the, on the colonial bryozoan. Um, sponges. So, uh, kind of closing in on the end here. Yeah, we're just about done. So um, the porifera, uh, phylum porifera, uh, and the word porifera means pore bearer. Um, sponges, uh, they're, uh, they were very abundant during the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and still are today uh, in the Cenozoic, but 
it's kind of rare to find sponges as fossils because they mainly, uh, they're soft gelatinous organisms. Um, there's one class of sponges that had silica spicules. You can see that here. This is a, di a diagram. These little star shaped, uh, the Astrio spongia had spicules of either silica or calcium carbonate, and they, they preserve very well. Sometimes you just find spicules. Uh, sponges were filter feeders. Um, there, there's uh, three main classes of sponges that are all represented as, uh, as fossils also. They range from Precambrian to recent. Um, I don't think I've ever found a fossil sponge. Um, I've just never found one. I don't, I don't even think I have any in my uh, collection. And then we move to the stromatolites. I'm including stromatolites uh, in the um, invertebrate fossils because uh, stromatolites in the Precambrian period, these were the great oxygenators during the great oxygenation period of Earth's atmosphere. Uh, stromatolite, uh, the word stromatolite means layer rock. Stroma means layer and uh, light from lithos, so layered rock or sheet-like rock. They're in their own phylum. It's phylum cyanobacteria, the green-blue, green-blue algae, green-blue bacteria. The geologic range, there are stromatolites that uh, still exist today. Uh, the bottom picture here, this is Shark Bay, Australia. Um, uh, a hypersaline, shallow, warm, salty water bay uh, that has growing colonies of stra uh, stromatolites that have survived over geologic time. Uh, we believe that um, back in the Precambrian, uh, stromatolites were the first large colonial primitive organisms to populate the Earth's ocean, and they were photosynthetic. So they released oxygen into the Earth's atmosphere. Um, but as they released that first oxygen, it encountered all of the iron that was present in the oceans. And oxygen and iron have an affinity for each other, and they bind chemically, and they form Fe2O3, which is hematite, or Fe3O4, which is magnetite. Uh, so as the stromatolites in the ancient Precambrian oceans released oxygen, it combined with iron. That iron uh, precipitated to the bottom of the ocean, and it built up the famous BIFs, the banded iron formations. Uh, some of these are the actual stromatolites themselves. Um, and we're, uh, we're lucky that this happened because during the great oxygenation event of the Earth, after all of the iron was oxidized, then it was free to be released to the atmosphere. And we had the um, oxygenation of the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, stromatolites are fairly common, and you can even find them um, as recently as um, Eocene, Eocene rock layers in Wyoming. Now, there are some huge uh, deposits of stromatolites. And here, here are some stromatolites. Uh, that I have in my collection. These are all from Australia. They're all Precambrian. This is a large uh, chunk of Precambrian stromatolite that I've cut and polished. Um, you can see kind of like the textured uh, lumpy surface. This would have been the upper surface of a growing stromatolite. And uh, the laminae are kind of difficult to see in here, but you can see the layered growth. And this is a stromatolite, uh, I believe from up in Canada. Um, it hasn't been cut or polished. This is how it was weathered out of the rock. So with stromatolites, oh, one other thing I'll mention, um, the uh, under porifera in the new Paris limestone quarry, um, another class of porifera are the stromatotoporoids. Stromatotoporoids look like stromatolites, but they're actually related to sponges. And there are a lot of them in the new Paris limestone quarry. So you'll have a chance to, uh, if you're going on that trip, you'll have a chance to find some stromatotoporoids, which um, uh, look a lot like uh, stromatolites, but they're, but they're more related to sponges. So that takes us through, I think, pretty much all the major phylum of um, invertebrate fossils. And I just kind of, um, I wasn't sure how much time we would have left. And I was just going to kind of show people some quick pictures and ask them to chime in on their identifications. So um, I'll just show these to you and you can just do it uh, so we don't take up more time. And if there's any questions, we'll leave a little bit extra time. So you can just kind of look at pictures one through six here and see if you can identify um, either the common names or the phylum or what, what six organisms are you looking at there? All invertebrates. 
So number one, these are um, these are bryozoans. Number two, it's upside down, but uh, this is the calyx of a crinoid, the cup, the body of the crinoid with the plates. Number three, this is a crinoid stem, part of the column. Number four, uh, number four is actually a, um, that's a bivalve, all right? You're not seeing the other side, but that's actually a fossilized bivalve, not a brachiopod. Uh, the other half of the shell would have been symmetrical. This is an ammonite. And there's a brachiopod. Uh, and then finally, uh, here's uh, six more. So you can see if you can identify the name or the phylum or the type of animal you're looking at. Number seven is a, uh, this is the tail or the pygidium of trilobite. Uh, number eight is a gastropod. Number nine, this happens to be a, this happens to be a Cambrian, lower Cambrian trilobite. I think this is uh, Olamellus. Uh, this is from Nevada, one of the earliest known trilobites. That's just the cephalon, uh, the part of the head. It's probably part of a malted shell. You can see a little bit of the genal spine here. One of the spines coming down off the right side. Here's an echinoid, uh, fossil sea urchin or sand dollar, um, fossil coral. It's actually a hexacoral, and here's a um, a rugosa, a rugose coral, giant solitary coral from the Paleozoic. So that brings our program. I ended up going to late twenty. So, hey, but, Steve, we have a question back on the previous slide, and number five. Yeah, uh, number five. Yep. Oh, you, it's where is it in, in the chat? Yeah. How, how can you tell the ammonite from a nautilus? Uh, let's see. Oh, how can you tell the ammonites from the Nautilus? Okay, the Nautilus will have, let me get my, let me get my magic marker out here. Um, probably the easiest way, if you, um, trying to draw a Nautilus shell here, okay? If you look at the shell of an, if you look at the shell of a Nautilus, okay, the, um, if you can see the fossilized siphuncal, the, the siphuncal of a nautilus will go through the, I'm trying to do this backwards here. Siphuncal of a nautilus will go through the middle of a shell. And if you have an ammonite, the siphuncal, I'm just gonna draw this as a squiggly line. If you have an ammonite, the siphuncal on the inside of the shell, or is my pen? Uh, my, the siphuncal will go along the outside of the shell. So a nautilus, a nautilus has a centered siphuncle and an ammonite has a siphuncle that goes through the outer edge of the shell. The other way you can tell is if you look at, um, let's see, I'm just gonna draw the, uh, uh, I'm just gonna draw, here's a piece of, um, here's a piece of the shell, all right? So if that's a shell, a nautilus will have, a nautilus will have a suture line that looks like that. So on the outside of the shell, you will see a wavy suture line. Uh, these are called saddles and lobes. So a nautilus will have a lobes and saddles. An ammonite looks like an ammonite has saddles and lobes, but they look like this. And I'm just going to take a second here to draw them. So here's what a nautilus will look like. Uh, I'm sorry, a nautilus, a nautilus has a smooth, simple saddle and lobe suture line. In ammonite, the suture line looks like this. It is extremely ornate. And um, we call that uh, sericitic or amionitic. And um, let's see, we can just go, let me go back here. Where was, uh, there it is. So this is, uh, this is, an, this is definitely 100%, this is an ammonite. Um, you look at the outside of the shell and right there, you can see the suture line and look at that. It almost looks like I, I, I tell my students um, in ammonite suture pattern, it looks like the frost that you see on a cold winter morning on your window. If you look at the, if you look at the frost that forms on your window, it will sometimes make this type of pattern. So an ammonite has this very 
intricate and detailed suture pattern. And if you have a really, really well-preserved animal, you can pick this up on one side of the shell and you can actually trace it the entire way around the shell to the other side. And what you're looking at, you're looking at this septum right here, um, where it touches the outside of the shell, that contact point. Um, now this, this ammonite, the, uh, the siphuncle is not preserved. This is not the siphuncle. That's the, this was, this is the outside of what uh, used to be the shell. All right. So that's the previous growing chambers. The si the siphuncle would be in here somewhere, but it's not preserved. The siphuncle probably ran through this little lobe right here. So you can see that each one of these septa has a lobe in it. So that's where the si the siphuncle is usually not preserved because it's a soft tissue part in an ammonite. So does that answer? We have other questions? Uh, quarry trip is free. Yeah, um, I suggest everyone coming to the quarry. You want to, um, uh, and you know, 